Hi, I'm Arthi. I'm a first year PA student at the University of Toronto. So I did my undergrad at Western University in uh, kinesiology and medical sciences and um, I took a lot of science courses um, and I think it provided a good foundation for PA school. Um, so especially in first semester it provided a good foundation for anatomy, physiology, um, and second semester it's helping with pharmacology as well. So um, kin and med science is a good uh, program to be in. My extracurricular activities, um, so from first year to uh, fourth year I was part of the Western tennis team and um, in fourth year I actually captained the team and that year we won uh, OUA so that was very special. Um, I did two mission trips with the Habitat for Humanity so we went to Tibeto, Louisiana and uh, we helped with the um, rebuilding houses and stuff for um, after Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Katrina. Um, another Extracurricular I did was uh, we I was VP internal as part of Ethnocultural Support Services, which was under uh, University Student Council. That was in fourth year, uh, so we organized events where um, we were trying to raise awareness for cultural diversity and um, different issues that came up on campus. Um, another extracurricular I did was volunteering at the local walk-in clinic. Um, those were probably my volunteer um, and extracurriculars, and then work was something different, so I tutored at Oxford Learning. I coached at University Tennis Club, and um, I think that's pretty much it. So how did you um, approach volunteering? Like, did it begin in university? Did it begin in high school? Um, so it began in high school, um, grade nine, so we had to meet the 40-hour requirement to um, uh, graduate and I actually started enjoying volunteering so I started off at a retirement home and then um, I moved on to work at Joseph Brandt Hospital uh, where I started off in the gift shop and then moved on to ICU and eventually day surgery and uh, I started using my volunteer experiences to navigate uh, different career options so I also volunteered at uh, a physiotherapy clinic to see if kinesiology would be a good undergrad option for me um, I think I enjoyed spending time with different uh, patients and the different populations. So at retirement home, it was more the seniors, and then at the hospital, it could be a variety of ages. And I got the opportunity to work with athletes at the physiotherapy clinic. So it gave me exposure to patient care experience and uh, my interest in sciences. Mm -hmm. And were you doing all these leadership positions right from the get-go in first year, or did you build up to it? Um, I think I built up to it because first year I was a bit trying to get oriented with my academics and then as I got comfortable with uh, my learning style and uh, uh, how to study and how to be efficient with my studying I got more um, comfortable adding on more extracurriculars so I think um, third year and fourth year I probably uh, took on more leadership roles in my extracurriculars and a good example would be tennis um, where as a captain I had more duties to do I had to make sure the whole team was happy and the whole team was uh, healthy and fit to be competing um, and I also was able to work with the, um, the coach um, to like come up with lineups and discuss like this player's strengths and weaknesses and um, I think I got more comfortable with those leadership positions as I progressed through undergrad. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about your healthcare experience hours? So for school, I guess um, for PA program, most of my healthcare experience hours came from uh, working as a kinesiologist after graduating. I worked at two physiotherapy clinics and uh, the common uh, responsibilities included setting up patients with treatment modalities, so ultrasound, TENS, IFC, um, and also teaching them exercises. At one clinic particularly, the gym was my office, so um, I worked with multiple patients, but I had to make sure the form was good, and then um, once those exercises became easier for them, I had to progress them to harder or more challenging exercises, and that was really rewarding um, to see them kind of go through the recovery process. So that's where I got most of my hours from, um, and then aside from that, I used my high, high school experiences as well as... Um, some other uh, volunteer experiences I did throughout undergrad. So uh, in the summer, I started off volunteering at a family health clinic close to home. And then um, the next summer, I got, it, uh, I got hired at the same place to work as a medical assistant to complete patient profiles. Um, so I completed a lot of patient profiles, and there was a lot of um, 
communication required and uh, some of these patients were ESL so um, English was their second language and they had to find alternate modes of communication so that challenged me in a different aspect um, and then there was a walk-in clinic close to university where I did about four to eight hours weekly um, and again it was a different population uh, it was closer to the rural um, areas of London and downtown areas so the population was different there I think that's pretty much it so aside from the high school ones those were my undergrad ones how did you get the job uh, volunteering at the like, what was your end for those opportunities? Well, kinesiology was an interesting story. So after graduating, um, I couldn't find a job for two months. So I actually did the Explore program after um, my fourth year, and I applied before I went. And then even throughout the five weeks I was at the Explore program, I didn't hear back. And kin is a very competitive um, I guess job to get because um, volunteers could do some of those uh, duties. So sometimes people prefer to hire volunteers. So it was actually... Um, so July, so a few months after I graduated, it was uh, during a tennis match <laughs> where I played against my boss's husband, um, and he overheard me saying I did my, kines uh, my degree in kinesiology and um, that I was looking for a job, and he's like, hey, my wife's looking to hire. Um, and then so I submitted my uh, resume and then went in for an interview, and it was quite far from home. Um, it was in Orangeville, and I was in Brampton, so um, I had to get a car and get used to it, but like that's how you start, right? And um, in terms of other clinics, I just... Uh, uh, applied and then I showed up and I tried to follow up as much as I could because a lot of people were applying so that was like the walk-in clinic uh, close to university and uh, the one I worked uh, at throughout the summer it was um, actually my, fam my mom's family doctor so not mine at that time and uh, I was like I was just there with my mom uh, and then I was like oh like this is what I did my studies in are there any opportunities um, so I guess like just use your <laughs> network and kind of uh, try to um, advocate for yourself and say this is what my background is, this is how I can help your clinic. Sometimes you have to start off as a volunteer and kind of uh, prove your skills and prove yourself before you get hired. Um, and as a student, it's probably best if you can get hired, especially with uh, finances and stuff, but yeah. Can you sort of speak to how pre-PAs could try to diversify their experiences? The main tip I would give in terms of getting healthcare experiences, there's no right way. So that's a, that's a common question I get from pre-PAs. It's like, what should I do my healthcare experience in to make my application stand out? And I think there's no right um, magic recipe, per se. Um, it's more just do what interests you. And um, you can, if you do what interests you, you'll shine in that field. And um, you, the passion kind of shows when you speak about it at interviews. Um, so in our class particularly, we have people from a variety of backgrounds. Um, at U of T, uh, you require 910 hours of patient care experience. So we have uh, people who are paramedics for 23 years. We have people who have like um, sleep techs, um, PTs, and medical, a lot of medical assistants, uh, nurses who chose um, PA over a nurse practitioner. So it's, everyone has a different story, um, and everyone's... Uh, choice of uh, entering PA school was based on their uh, healthcare experience, or at least it played a role in it. Absolutely. And um, what was your GPA? Um, so my GPA uh, was interesting. So um, I started off, so my cumulative GPA is 3.61. Um, but I think, uh, personally, I, I think uh, I started off really low. I took a lot of, uh, I overloaded my first three years because I wanted to add that minor in med side. So I think first year was about 3.4. And then fourth year, I finished with a 3.83. I guess that showed my ability to understand what my learning style was and how to study efficiently while balancing other uh, extracurriculars. So I think... Um, I think this speaks to saying like you don't have to have like a 4.0 GPA to get into any of these professional schools. I mean, it is nice, but um, even if you don't, don't get demotivated because um, as long as there's progression or there are other aspects to your application where if you can balance extracurriculars with a good GPA, it still shows like a strong candidate for the program. And how did you maintain that balance in order to keep your grades up? Um, so personally, I'm the type of person who likes to... Uh, go, go, go. So um, I tried to schedule different uh, things. So like sometimes a tennis practice would help me kind of um, relieve my stress before I go back into studying during exam season or um, a workout or hanging out with friends or just talking to my roommate. So those little um, breaks, I, I guess breaks or extracurricular breaks, um, helped me kind of accelerate those brief uh, time slots that I had for studying. Um, so, and I, I just love variety, so I don't like to just sit for like 10 hours and continuously study, so I'll have like a break in between, um, which is kind of something I'm trying to uh, maintain from undergrad and in PA school.
-hmm. And were there major differences between what you did in like your first three years versus fourth year? Okay, so um, first year I tried to maintain my study techniques from high school and that was definitely difficult because um, there was a lot more content and there was less time for that content so you couldn't just memorize, memorize, memorize. So first year was, again, that's why it was a bit difficult for me to kind of grasp those concepts and uh, I was surrounded by a lot of medical science students who came from um, IB or like had really good study skills. So I try to learn from my peers and I try to try my um, own different things or in terms of learning techniques. Um, and then progressing to fourth year, I started um, trying out different techniques again and I found what worked for me. So I was always the person who would um, talk out loud or like try to um, teach it to someone, to teach concepts to someone. But um, as I went through undergrad, I'd like to write concepts out and kind of summarize as I did that and I found those different techniques um, or exploring those different techniques throughout undergrad helped me and I'm trying to uh, maintain that throughout PA school but again if you're always learning and you're always modifying your learning techniques because PA school is um, super accelerated so you don't have time to write out all 200 pages of notes for pathology or something so you got to find uh, different ways and I think group study is something I got into coming into PA school. And how does group study work for you guys? So group study, um, considering um, we're doing online learning right now, we use the online platform that's offered by UFT, so we use Blackboard, and um, whoever's in the group study just logs on, and then we have like a blank uh, whiteboard, or we could um, actually upload different images or different PDFs um, online so everyone could see it and follow along. And then sometimes we just test each other, so we'll be like, oh, can you explain this concept to me, um, and then add on uh, new concepts, or if you're explaining something to them, you ask them to... Uh, repeat it back in their own words to make sure um, they solidify their understanding. Um, and then sometimes we ask each other questions. So depending on what stage of learning you're at, so initially you're not going to drill them with questions, um, you'd probably uh, try to explain concepts to each other and then probably the day before you're trying to ask questions. And um, it's amazing how something someone told you the night before the exam actually shows up on the exam and you're like, okay, this is perfect. So you learn from each other and it's also the supportive aspect of group studying that helps. And is that the method that you used in a no, so group study I did not do so much in undergrad and that's something I learned uh, to get comfortable with in PA school. Um, in undergrad I think I started off with like um, rote memorization, which is probably not the best from, under, from high school, uh, to um, starting to write things out and using a whiteboard. So that was my probably my best purchase in fourth year where I used a whiteboard to draw different pathways out and I remember particularly for one course, uh, exercise biochemistry, I had to remember Krebs cycle. and it was brutal, but I had to keep drawing it out, and it actually helped me. So I thought that was surprising when you try new techniques. Um, and another thing is when you try these new techniques, you do feel a bit um, this vulnerable, for lack of a better term, because you're like, oh, I don't know. Like, I'm trying this out. I don't know if it's going to work until you get to the test. So um, some of those techniques didn't work for me, but most of the time, I'm grateful that it actually worked out, and the group study seems to be working for this semester for me. Um, how did you figure out what you wanted to do and... How did you get to the PA program? PA program? Um, in high school, I was uh, focused on kinesiology. So I initially was life science and medical school. And then I changed last minute to kinesiology because I thought the anatomy and physiology was a good foundation for any career in medicine. Um, and I was still exploring options. So I applied, I guess, moving through first to second year, I was looking at other options, and then third year I was like, okay, maybe it is medicines or med school. So I applied to med school, I took the MCAT and everything, and even then it was like half-hearted. I was like, I don't know if this is what I want, there's a lot of schooling, finances, um, and then the work-life balance while you're in school as well as after. Um, so those were different factors I was considering, still looking for options, and then I think it was between second or third year where I literally just Googled um, a career in medicine that's similar to a doctor but shorter schooling or something that was super long for Google to even process but um, the PA program at Manitoba actually showed up and uh, I was like no this can't be real and I kept looking into it I was like this can't be real like this is so good this is too good to be true and then I called my mom and she's like no that's not possible I've never seen a PA and then um, I guess like as I progressed through undergrad by fourth year I was like this is like this is really good, and I did more research, and I found more schools um, in the states as well as UFT and Mac. Um, and I think it was second semester, fourth year, where I was like, "This is what I'm doing. I'm not applying to med anymore because this has kind of been what I've wanted." And I think the more I researched about the PA profession, the more I wanted to do it, which I didn't feel the same for medical school personally. Um, 
so it was a Google search and um, a lot of research after that when I was applying to American schools, looking at different uh, schools and different, um, I guess, the opportunity to uh, try different specialties. So um, that was definitely something uh, that happened, my, one of my major epiphanies in fourth year. Um, so when I applied, I applied to the States originally um, because I was a bit hesitant uh, because the profession wasn't established in Canada. So I was thinking of going to the States and then um, it wasn't until I did more research and came across your page and how there were like trailblazers for the profession here. And I was like, you know what? I love this profession so much that I would like to be part of uh, this trailblazer community and uh, contribute to the growth of the profession in Canada. So um, that's when I changed my mind. So I did get an offer um, in a, at a university in New York. And uh, when I went to the interview is when I realized like it was like quadruple the tuition and it was... It was a lot of uh, like lifestyle uh, adjustments that I had to make to move to the states, as well as like health insurance, multiple other factors. So um, we decided to stay close to home, and then um, Mac and UFT. I had to choose, which was a really tough choice. And um, again, I sat. So every time I get stuck into what like in terms of what to do, so for med versus PA and then MAC versus UFT, I always make like a list of pros and cons um, and kind of take some time to reflect on what I want um, in life, at least for a career choice, as well as what I, uh, what works for me in terms of learning style. Um, so that's why, that's how I ended up at UFT. So I applied to Manitoba as well, and um, I think there was one course that kind of stopped my application uh, early for Manitoba, biochemistry. Um, but other than that, yeah, I was like, I try to keep my options open, which is something you do in med. But um, I personally just like the profession in general. And I, it, we're, I think for U US, I try to ma narrow my universities because there are, I think, more than 170 or something universities. Can't apply to all. And um, the GRE was like a major um, requirement for a lot of universities. So I did not take that, um, especially straight out of undergrad. So... I think, um, yeah, it's a different process, but I try to keep my options open applying to Manitoba, U of T Mac, as well as uh, the states. So that's a really good idea, doing the pros and cons list. Mm -hmm. And um, you didn't shadow a PA in undergraduate? I did. So it was not during undergrad. I did it during my year off, so between completing undergrad and starting PA school, um, because I was curious as to um, what a PA exactly does. Like, you can read about it, but seeing it um, in person. So it took a while, but I eventually came across the observerships offered by UHN, and um, I got three placements, so I started off in general surgery at Toronto General, and then I, um, I think from there I kind of navigated into uh, radiation oncology and then neurosurgery, and I also had an ER um, placement lined up, which I actually followed through with as an LCE placement in my first year of okay. PA school. So it sounds like you went through Matry, you went through, was it Leslie St. Jacques? Yes, it was, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. who was the Toronto? Um... Toronto General was um, Krista Slavinsky. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 Some of them are U of T grads. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So yeah, Krista was my first, um, uh, I guess, preceptor for the observership, and uh, she was telling me about her experience at UFT, and then I went to Matry, and I heard about like the McMaster experience, and um, I forget where Leslie did, I think it was Mac as well. She was Mac as she well. Was Mac. Yeah, and um, so I heard about her experience as well, and it's in interesting how um, different people, uh, hearing different people's perspectives, and then seeing what the different uh, things PAs can do in different specialties. So it was really nice. I think observerships is something I would recommend for someone who's like, what does a PA do, and like, what am I able to do after um, going through PA school? Was there a big difference in terms of what you read about a PA and what you saw in person? I think it varies based on settings um, and who you're working with. So if a PA had more residents or fellows in their team, um, then there was probably less work to do, but then um, they would be like filling in the gaps in terms of patient care, but if you were part of a smaller team or um, if there were less residents and fellows, then you had more to do. So it depends on the setting, um, and I think when I was reading about it, it seemed like it was like a, almost like a set scope of practice, um, but I think one of the key things to know is the PA's role is very flexible, and um, I think that's what makes it super unique because you don't have that set scope of practice, and for someone who likes variety, I think that's like something that's intriguing to me. Mm -hmm.
And um, what advice would you give to people that can't seem too secure in observership because shadowing is, is very difficult to obtain in Canada? So I think um, educating yourself about the profession in any means. So there are YouTube videos, and like personally, that's why I started my Instagram page just to kind of um, advocate for the profession and like say this is what we do, at least as a student versus um, placements. Um, so there are other means other than observerships, but um, if you do have the opportunity to do observerships, if not. There's Anne's page, and um, there are multiple resources out there. And feel free to reach out to PA students or even practicing PAs, um, and just ask them about how they, um, what their experiences are like, or what they do on a like on a daily. Because it doesn't have to be in person. Sometimes even just hearing about it might seem to clip. And how can students find those PAs or PA students? Um, so I think networking <laughs> is key. So. Um, PA is a growing profession, so networking is key, and um, sometimes even on Instagram, or um, I think Instagram is probably like a good platform where you find um, PA or PA students uh, through hashtag search, which is how most of the pre-PAs reach out to me, um, and just starting a conversation and um, going from there, so saying, I'm interested in this, do you have any input on this? Because um, we do have like an international medical graduate in our class, and um, I had a couple of students who were from abroad who were like, I'm interested in PA school, and I'm an international medical graduate and um, using your network so them reaching out to me I can reconnect them to um, the student in our class to start a conversation like that so there's definitely different uh, opportunities or different possibilities um, so just reach out and ask, ask your questions and say hi. Where are you in your PA education right now? So I started in September so I think I'm about five six months in right now um, in first year and um, so I guess you could say halfway through uh, second semester um, and we're just kind of diving into reading week right now so um, yeah. And what do you have left for your finishing your key education? So I have another semester which kind of um, goes in through the summer until end of August and then I have second year which is the clinical year so I'm just I'll finish up my didactic year and then dive into clinical year before graduating. Okay. So there is a misconception that PA Consortium is 100% online. Um, can you explain how first year PA school works at U of T? Yes, most of it is online, but there are residential blocks where everyone from um, the program, wherever they are geographically, they all come to Toronto. And uh, we have in-class um, we have in-class uh, sessions. So most of it is clinical skills focused because you want to learn your physical exam skills and um, other hands-on skills. But um, there are other uh, courses or like intro to courses. So in September, we got an intro to uh, intro to PA role course and then um, in December res block we had a wrap up for certain courses and then kind of introducing you to second semester courses before uh, Christmas break so residential block is there's a lot of variety sometimes um, you meet with the program directors and they ask for feedback and then they kind of update you about how things are going to go or even like uh, setting you up with clinical rotation so kind of starting that earlier on those all take place during res block and then once you move on to online learning which is um, most of the time. So, sorry, going back to res block, in September was four weeks, December was like about a week and a half, April we have one coming up about two weeks, and then July, second half of July and first half of August is our last res block. Um, so, moving on to online learning, that kind of fills in the gap between those res blocks, and uh, it's a lot of um, self learning. So, you are given a set number of lectures and you do that on your own time. And the good thing about online learning is you get to schedule your own day. So, um, if one day you're doing an LCE, so Tuesdays um, every week is allocated for LCEs, then you have the other days to kind of work around that. Um, and uh, yeah, most of them are recorded lectures, and then you also have weekly meetings for each course to make sure you're staying on top of things. And this could be through class discussion, or this could be through quizzes um, to make sure you're up to date. Um, so it helps you keep, uh, keep on top of things. But uh, online learning is probably the time when most of the people fall behind, but you do have the in-class portions where you are able to mingle with class. And how do tests work? Do you go in person, or are they done online? Yeah, so tests, um, so quizzes, are kind of online at home, but tests you actually go to a proctor site. So for the people close to Toronto or who can commute to Toronto, we um, have someone as part of the program or like the professor or the TA who kind of uh, proctors the exam. Um, so you go to uh, a building on campus, UFT campus, and take the test. Um, for people who are further away, they actually set up their own proctor site, which is approved through the UFT program um, coordinator, and then uh, they take it there. So sometimes it's five minutes away from their home, sometimes they have to like drive a bit or sometimes they just like to come to Toronto um, so there's a lot of uh, flexibility and they usually the program tries to make it work for you. 
but for those that are, for your classmates who are outside of the GTA, mm -hmm. um, what arrangements do they have to make to be present for those residential blocks, especially if they're four weeks instead of one and a half weeks? For sure, yeah. So Airbnb is a common, um, common uh, option for uh, the students who are coming from afar and I think uh, from September res block to December res block people started pairing um, with other classmates to get a place together so usually Airbnb seems to be the common thing that people get closer to campus um, so that they can commute and take the subway so um, and it's they try to get it done as early as possible so that they can save some money but most of the time people are doing the online portion at home so that kind of helps with that too. Mm -hmm. And um, for the residential blocks, is it class time like 8 to 4 every day, Monday to Friday? How does it work? So every day is different. Um, sometimes we have super long days where we start at 8 and uh, we finish at 5. Or sometimes we have shorter days where we start around like 9, 30, 10 and we finish at 3, 30. Um, it all depends on the schedule and every day... Um, most of the days you have clinical skills, but um, some days you have like a lunch with uh, discussing and providing feedback. So those kind of uh, take away, I guess, the busyness of the day. But yeah, every day is different and um, there's no set schedule per se. And they usually try to post it before you come for res block or before the res block starts so that you can kind of prepare for the week ahead. And um, can you walk us through uh, the last, um, I said you, you mentioned a week and a half was the most recent. Mm -hmm. What was every day like? If you just break it down for us? Um, so I think the major um, focus for December Res Block was clinical skills, um, specifically the female male pelvis and then uh, the biopsychosocial uh, module. So we focused a lot on see, like learning about it and then the next day we'd see SPs or standardized patients for that. Um, so that was mostly the focus of December Res Block and we had our um, clinical skills exam which had the EPBL, which is electronic problem-based learning. And the clinical skills uh, we learned specifically for December res block was what the exam was at the end of that res block. Um, other things we did was uh, an intro to farm. So there is this rational prescribing framework um, that uh, the prof thought was very, good, uh, very important that we address it in person so that we can kind of have a conversation, which is probably a bit easier than online. Um, so that was something we got an intro to. Um, we had, uh, I think we had a curriculum committee meeting, so that the curriculum committee meeting rep went there, so that was kind of uh, at the end of semester one checking in. Um, a lot of feedback sessions, and, um, we had to do it on our, uh, do the physical exam on our partner or our classmate. Um, so you had to kind of speak it out, it's almost like a mock OSCE, um, so that was really helpful and it was just a pass or fail, so there was no really, um, there were three sections where you kind of did it or they were probed you to do it and then you totally forgot to do it, so it was, it was less than a typical, or less like a typical uh, testing um, for OSCE, but it was a good practice. So those are probably the major things that happened during December Res Block. Okay. And you did a class with Ontario K Chapter President Denise O'Leary. What was the title of the class and what did you enjoy about it? So that, <laughs> Denise taught us intro to PA role um, and that we started off, so that was another um, course that we got an intro to in September. And uh, I particularly enjoyed that course because it gave you a good foundation to um, just a PA profession in general. So we talked about different topics like funding, regulation, um, different uh, like the economics like healthcare and how the healthcare system works. We had guest lecturers who came in which was also very um, interesting. Um, and in terms of uh, assignments, like we had like a lot of readings to do which was kind of difficult at the time because we were just trying to get used to the PA program. But I think looking back in retrospect, it's, it was very beneficial because you start to kind of learn more about the profession, but also it's almost self-learning. So you, you're taught the ways to kind of look up these kind of um, topics on your own. And um, we had quizzes on those readings, and then we also had different interesting assignments, which were super creative. Um, so I think some of those assignments, uh, if I remember, uh, is PA profile. So we had to film a video of ourselves talking about the PA profession and kind of with a personal touch to it. So I did mine. You can do it in any format, so it was super creative. I did mine in an interview format where my classmate asked me questions, and I talked about um, myself and the PA profession almost like uh, making it seem like I'm applying for a job as a PA, so kind of jumping ahead, but it was, um, it was interesting because it was challenging to kind of uh, take a creative approach. That was one assignment. Um, we had a lot of discussion posts, so that was like a key aspect of the course where um, people would ask questions, you would answer questions, and um, one of our final assignments was based on that. You would choose one category, so it was either regulation, funding, or um, there were, I think, two other topics, or you could even come up with your own topic. Denise was really good with that. She was super flexible. Um, 
and uh, you would just start a discussion and then you would write an opinion editorial after that about that um, topic that you were you chose to do it on. Um, so there were a lot of uh, interesting assignments where, which made you think about the profession and see if it was something uh, that kind of aligned with your interests and needs. So it was definitely a good course. Mm -hmm. What were some of those editorial topics that your classmates came up with? So it was why PAs need to be regulated, um, so opinion editorial on that, or why PAs need more funding, or why healthcare system needs to um, allocate more funds towards PAs, and what PAs contribute to the healthcare system, so different topics like that. And uh, while you write this opinion editorial, you do research about it, and you do learn more about it. So it's not like just a typical lecture-based uh, learning. It was a different way of learning, and um, again, self-taught, so it was, it was interesting. <laughs> And you have a class called LCE. How does that work? Yep, yeah, so LCE is uh, Longitudinal Clinical Experience. So I think it's similar to LPs, which is um, longitudinal, longitudinal, placements. longitudinal Placements at MAC. So we are expected to do 30 to 40 hours max um, in any clinical setting. So in certain semesters, um, we have some requirements where it's like 10 hours has to be primary care, which includes family medicine as well as emergency medicine. Um, and then other, you can also do other specialties. So um, the thing about LCE is, is you are expected to kind of reach out and network. So this goes back to the importance of networking. Um, we are given an LCE database to kind of um, reach out to people who've taken students on before, but um, yeah, based on your interest, you do these clinical placements, and again, throughout the week, Tuesdays are allocated for those placements, and uh, your day could range from just four hours, or until, when I did general surgery, it was from 7.30 in the morning all the way to 5.30 in the evening, so it can be longer days. Um, yeah, so just based on your interest, you choose these placements, and you do it every semester. So every semester has a different uh, requirement, and as you progress, so third, second and third semester is more focused on specialties, while first semester you have primary care as well as allied health professionals, which is um, when I was able to do the super cool um, EMS placement, so with the paramedics. Okay, and are you required to do anything? Is it just observing, or are you writing a sick note? Yeah, yeah, so um, it depends. So when you're at the place, um, depending on what the placement is, so with the paramedic stuff, I wasn't able to do anything. There was a lot of observership, but I did have a lot of um, discussions with the paramedics, so like what their thought process was and that emergent situation and why they did certain things. Um, so for those kind of experiences, you're writing a reflection piece. Um, so just kind of reflecting on like what your goals were going in and what you learned throughout, um, what things you found challenging and different uh, things like that. Um, if it was a more clinical setting, so when I did general surgery or when I did family medicine and ER, you do write soap notes. So every semester you have about four, you have to do four soap notes and one reflection, and then first semester, sorry, for this semester it was four soap notes and one reflection. Last semester was three soap notes and two reflections, so you had more flexibility. So in addition to the paramedics, I did the coroner's office, which was also another interesting experience where I could reflect on um, how I felt during the experience. Um, but the soap notes one, you would you would be expected to write, um, you start off with the basic framework and then you start moving on to the assessment and then our differential diagnosis uh, list went from five to 10 for the semester. So kind of broadening your, um, I guess broadening your thoughts and like trying to look at the big picture. So um, yeah, those are the requirements. It's good they have you uh, doing some clinical reasoning in first year. So. For sure, yeah. And it really helps to um, think that way when you do those soaknas at home in the comfort of home and then going into a clinical setting, you're able to think on the spot and provide these differentials to your preceptor. So can you walk us through a typical week of a non-residential block, uh, Monday to Friday, how that looks for you? Yep, um, so online learning, if it's like non-residential, um, varies. Again, every week's different and every semester is different. So, um, okay, so first semester, uh, starting off on Monday, we didn't really have anything, but Tuesdays were allocated to LCEs. Wednesdays were um, physiology, so we had a physiology meeting. Um, Thursdays, we had clinical skills um, in the morning, which is something that we maintain throughout uh, all three semesters in first year. And um, Fridays, we had our anatomy meeting. So depending on when these meetings were, you try to cover the lecture material for that meeting, because uh, the meetings would be anywhere from like quiz questions to like discussions about concepts or like even case studies. So in order to contribute to those or even um, learn from those case studies, um, you probably wanted to keep up with the material. Um, this semester is a bit more different, so it's not very, um, it's, there's a more variety. So um, 
farm is usually scheduled on Monday. Mondays are the busiest days this semester. So farm is usually scheduled on Monday. Um, we It could be a variety of going through case studies where students are actually expected to um, work, work up the case um, beforehand. And you're assigned into groups, and uh, certain groups are expected to run the discussion or facilitate the discussion, and kind of um, the professor chimes in and provides her input as you do that. Um, and then there's also, there's sometimes lecture material where um, either the prof or a guest lecturer comes in and talks about dyslipidemia or acute coronary syndrome and different, um, different concepts like that and the medications for those uh, particular conditions. Um, and then following farm, you have pathology, which is, again, why Monday is super busy. Pathology is very, um, it's just one hour, but it's very dense. And uh, pathology is also um, probably one of the courses where we have a lot of lecture material to cover. So um, again, going back to the group study, so I personally, this semester, I split it up. So if we have like 21 lectures and there's, or 24 lectures and there's like six of us, then each of us only has to do um, four lectures. So it brings down the workload and then you review the notes after and prepare for these pathology meetings, where again, it could be case studies, it could be the professor asking you, okay, so what is this? And you kind of have to reword it because it is a lot of material in terms of lecture. So you kind of um, provide your summarized version of that. And then that's followed by a quiz. So again, farm starts with the quiz and then you have lecture and then you have pathology class and then a quiz. So that's this, um, this semester's Mondays. Tuesdays, again, LCE placements. Um, Wednesdays are free this semester. And then Thursdays, again, clinical skills. Um, so compared to last semester, this semester, they changed up clinical skills. So it's more discussion. Instead of presenting um, a specific learning objective, you're actually facilitating a discussion. And then um, Fridays, we have I'm trying to remember, so DTP, so Diagnostic Techniques and Procedures, where again, it's case studies, um, or they, he'd go through the um, concepts specific for the readings for that week, and then he'll provide you with multiple choice quiz questions, um, and then put up a poll on the Blackboard um, app, and then um, after that, you kind of go through cases and like what uh, investigation, so focusing on the investigations aspect of uh, the cases. So that's this uh, semester, is that week through this semester. Um, and weekends that are kind of open. So like I usually there's nothing scheduled. So I try to again going back to my way of learning. I try to schedule like a lunch with a friend or like a workout midday so that um, I kind of uh, compartmentalize my studying. So in the morning I do more of like the studying and learning, and then in the evening more like the assignments or like casework up for our farm and stuff like that. Great. And uh, what is IPE? IPE is interprofessional education, so um, there are different requirements. So there's core activities and then there's elective activities. And um, throughout the two years, you're expected to um, complete at least two electives, but then there are core activities where everyone completes them and uh, you're expected to attend. So we actually just had one a couple of days ago where it was online and everyone from um, everyone is able to attend that one because it is online. But sometimes they try to schedule it during res blocks where everyone's here or um, Sometimes it's for half the group. So it always varies for the core activity, but everyone is expected to complete those. And uh, by interprofessional education, they want you to be aware of your colleagues or your future colleagues when you're working in the healthcare setting. So, um, so far I've met like PTs, OTs, medical students, um, speech language pathologists, dentists, pharmacists, and like we would do case studies together or depending on the activity you do, like case studies together and everyone kind of chimes in. And it's just interesting to learn about everyone's strengths and like their perspective on patient care. And just the recent one, a couple of days ago, was focused on involving the, or including the patient as part of the team, which is something that we don't usually think about because we focus on the disease and like different healthcare providers um, providing solutions to the disease, but um, the importance of involving the patient in the discussion. So um, the core activities are usually focused on that, and then the elective activities is more on how you can um, learn different concepts or um, apply different concepts. So I've done one on death and dying. I've done one on exercise prescriptions based on my kin background. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically based on interest for the electives. Mm -hmm. And um, is first year a very lonely process or do, is there some kind of community or way that you guys stay in touch? For sure. So first semester, um, they say November is probably the loneliest month because September is really like everyone's around you. You're always spending time with your classmates. And then October, you're kind of getting used to the online learning. I guess um, it's kind of like a downtime before November. You're like, oh man, I really miss my classmates. And um, 
as the semester is kind of wrapping up, or at least the online portion is wrapping up, it does get a bit lonely. So I think this semester we try to make more changes. So um, I personally like to um, meet up with people who are closer to me geographically. So like um, just a few days ago, I uh, spent a few days with uh, my friend from Oakville, um, or my, <laughs> my classmate from Oakville, and it's. It's interesting how like you kind of group together and it's like you need that kind of social support um, and your classmates only know what you're going through so it's perfect. Um, and with in terms of online uh, communication, like we always try to um, Facebook message our classmates and make sure like you know you're kind of keeping in touch or even like having an online video chat like it's always there's always something you can do. So I think this semester I've started to learn like the importance of kind of keeping in touch with classmates and um, making time for those kind of conversations and taking a break because it's definitely an important aspect of going through such an accelerated program. Absolutely. And have they let you know anything about uh, second year clerkship placements yet? So I think in July, um, we get to know what kind of rotations we're going to do and when we're going to do them. So U of T is unique for having five months up north and five months uh, down south. So um, in July, you get to know about that. But you can provide, I think it was in September as well, we provided information based on where our home location is. So um, I put like Toronto because I live here, and then I put my parents' house um, in Brampton. But then if you have any connections up north, you could provide that information as well. Um, and they kind of, you, the program helps you kind of find locations. So, so far I've only, um, I guess, personal, personal experience, like that's what I know about my um, second year plans. But I've heard uh, feedback from second year students and it seems to be, um, they seem to be enjoying it. So I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, do you have contact with the second year students or alumni from the VOT? Yeah, for sure. So. Um in, I think when I got my acceptance, I got a phone call from a second year student. So you get like a PA buddy who kind of uh, welcomes you in and is there to answer any questions you have throughout the summer. And then you get, uh, I guess that was a pre-PA buddy, and then I guess you get, uh, and then you get a PA buddy um, you get paired with for the entire first year. Um, personally, I've been super close with the second year class rep. So um, as the first year class rep, I talk a lot with him about like things we can do and how to prep for the management committee meetings. Um, and he always checks in on me after like an exam or like how are you feeling for this exam and um, especially this semester like pharmacology was our first exam and it's a different way of learning we answer learning objectives after learning uh, reading materials and going through lectures um, so he, he always checked in on that and it's it's super supportive um, it's super comforting to have those kind of uh, mentors and um, I always keep in touch with like PA graduates, like even U of T or Mac, like just to kind of get that perspective, like what it is like working in like the real world, and um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, for those that do, uh, so you're a few months now into PA school. What advice would you have for students who do get accepted, like the summer before the first day of class? For sure. That you suggest? Yeah. So I think there are two types of people. So there are people who like to prepare for school in the during the summertime and then people who like to make the best out of their um, last few weeks of resting and like taking a vacation before starting school so I used to be like the former person trying to like prepare for a program and I think um, after first semester of PA school I learned that I should um, utilize my break times as much as possible because you kind of recharge and you're able to tackle the new semester or like um, just like when classes start because you literally just start you just hit the ground running and you need to take those or you need to make the best out of those break times so for pre-pas who get accepted i think it varies if if it's after undergrad like you graduated in june or you finish school in end of april and then you're starting in september pa school in september then definitely make use of your break time because um it's going to be it's going to be wild <laughs> when you get started but if you are taking a couple of years off or if you're working then feel free to skim through at least like the first uh, semester's material so anatomy and physiology just to kind of brush up on that um, but you also have the medical terminology course um, throughout the summer to kind of get you used to the online platform so that also keeps you kind of going although it's not graded it does help you um, kind of start studying and get introduced into the medical concepts and medical terminology so there's that and if you want to do something additional to that feel free to do so but I would strongly advise that you take at least the last couple of weeks before school starts off completely off okay and um any tips on how to stay organized and stay on top of uh, your material, study material in PA school? For sure. Um, so I personally like to use checklists 
Um, so I make a checklist of things I need to do for every course and that usually changes on a weekly basis. And then I have a calendar where I schedule, I make my weekly schedule on the Sunday. Um, so I take the checklist and I kind of allocate it to different days of the week. Um, and I think just like checking off that thing off the checklist kind of helps me or motivates me to keep going. Um, in terms of every day, um, I have a friend in my class who suggested doing a workday approach to um, studying. So you would study from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then you take the evenings off. Um, again, I had to change that a bit because I can't study for like nine hours straight. So I, um, I work from, I study from 7.30 to 12 and then I take a break where it'll be about like three hours where I... Um, I go to the gym or I like eat lunch and watch a show so I take like a mental break and then I continue again um, in the late evening and then I finish up like about 8.39. Um, so I guess it depends on uh, what works for everyone but um, I think checklists and uh, kind of allocating different things throughout the day of the week helps. Mm -hmm. um, how do you sit down and tackle a medical condition case or learning medications for example? Um, I think it it varies based on the course and it varies based on the concept. So medications I found to be very hard um, to get at least at the beginning of the semester because some of those words I couldn't even pronounce. So um, I think uh, trying to come up with different like mnemonics or different abbreviations and like um, whatever works for you really. So medication was probably one of the challenging things uh, to learn for me at least this semester. Um, with pathology or concepts like that where it's like a process or a disease process, you want to kind of step back and look at the big pictures but or big picture but also focus on the fine details because um, sometimes that's where uh, the medication affects the receptor or stuff like that. So um, I like to, I like one, I think one of our profs say start off with broad brush strokes and then start focusing on the fine detail and you wouldn't feel as overwhelmed because if you're looking at the small things, then it's like, okay, I need to step back and kind of look at the big picture. It, wor it works either way, but personally, I think I start off like broad and then I kind of focus in on the details. Um, yeah, so like disease process, medications, um, in terms of IPR, like intro to PA role courses, I think with the research aspects or even clinical skills has a lot of research aspects. I try to, um, sometimes they're provided with a case study and you have to think of differentials. I try to think of differentials based on disease process. So like if it's a lung problem, then it could be like fluid buildup or it could be like a foreign body or it could be like a pneumothorax, different things like that. Um, and then I try to look up, I, Toronto Notes is a really good resource for that. Um, and then also the online databases. So like PubMed and... Um, BMJ and different aspects like that. So I think uh, we got like a tutorial for that in September ResBlock on how to use the online resources. So depending on which course, just using different resources and whatever study technique works for you. Mm -hmm. So about documenting your PA journey, can you tell us a little bit about what you do on social media for your um, for PA? For sure. Um, so I had. I started off with an Insta page, so Instagram page, um, Arthi Kinta PA, and uh, I was initially thinking about documenting my um, transitioning from kinesiology or being a kinesiologist into PA school, um, but it's been very focused on PA school right now because of the advocacy of the profession and a lot of eager pre-PAs who want to know more about uh, the profession. Um, and then I, I think as I did that, I was writing really long Instagram posts blogging about my, well, captioning, it was supposed to be a caption, uh, uh, about my experience, and I thought, hey, like, I want to write more, but I'm limited in terms of words, so, like, why not start blogging? And um, I was thinking about doing an, a website, but it is super busy during PA school, so I try to utilize my breaks, so um, December uh, break, I try to work on that. And then uh, coming back into January, just kind of because I was super like recharged and rest well rested, I try to work more on that. Um, and then uh, videos I started getting into because I was talking to one of my friends who's in med school, and a common question we both got it's, it's interesting because PA profession is growing and more people know about it is why did you choose MD over PA or why did you choose PA over MD? So um, we did a video where we collaborated and talked about um, the application process as well as like what a typical day would look like or um, the different admission requirements, different things like that and why um, one may suit a candidate more than the other but again it was just our perspective and then like the pre-PAs will look at that and kind of uh, get their perspective. So I guess um, 
I started off with an Instagram page and then it kind of just branched based on like my interests and kind of just like the motivation I got from pre-PAs and interested other other interested students. Mm -hmm. And what's some of the feedback you've received so far from your classmates or from pre-PAs? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's been super positive so far. Um, so classmate-wise, like, uh, I think um, they also find it interesting to see kind of like a summary of like their, um, uh, of the res block or like the online portion. And I think it kind of encourages them to reflect on their experience as well. Um, and actually this month we have this uh, PA profiles of for a class of, UFT class of 2020 going on on the Instagram page where I asked my classmates to provide their perspective on three questions. So why they chose the PA career, um, any advice they have for pre-PAs as well as uh, how they found um, online learning in first semester. So it's, I think it's interesting for um, them to provide their perspective and I think it's helpful for pre-PAs to see different perspectives. Um, so classmates, that's um, kind of their uh, take on that. And pre-PAs, I always get messages, and it's super encouraging. It's like, hey, I found your page to be really useful. Like, um, I just have this question, and just like being able to answer um, based on my experience or even like helping them out is super rewarding. So um, I think those are the kind of positive feedback that kind of keeps me going and motivated to do or branch out mm -hmm. in other aspects. Um, can you speak to some of the differences between applying to American PA school versus Canadian PA school? Yeah, so I think because the profession is more established in uh, the U.S. and there are way more schools, it's similar in that they have uh, this online platform, so they have CASPA there for 200 plus universities, similar to OUAC in Canada or at least in Ontario universities, um, and it's, um, I think the requirements are similar. So you have the academic background, you have, well, you have the personal background, academic background. Um, and personally, I had to do a West evaluation to kind of make sure my transcript, my courses, and my degree would be equivalent to an American one. Um, and then you also talk about your experiences, write a brief blurb. And then another thing is when you add a university of interest into your CASPA application, uh, there were additional requirements. So there would be additional um, essays in addition to your supplemental or your personal statement in the States versus the supplemental application in Canada. And uh, it would usually be longer for the personal statement. And then you'd have these additional mini essays for each university sometimes. Um, so I think uh, Rutgers was one of the universities where I had to write five essays. And you'd have to take bits and pieces from your personal statement, but then cater it to that university's missions and goals and vision and all that stuff. So lots of research and lots of um, lots of schools to look into for the states. Um, and then it's similar process after that. So you would do your um, primary application and then you would have your interviews. And then um, the difference is that the states is a rolling admission. So the earlier you apply, the, I guess, the better your chances. So when I did my applications, I did my American applications in May. And I think it opened in April. So I started early and then I finished it in May and submitted in May. And then for Canada, you can start um, a bit, I think, late fall, and then it's due, primary applications are due in January, and then supplemental come in in February, and then interviews start um, April, May-ish. So it's different timeline, but similar process in that you have that one uh, database or one uh, online application where you kind of add in your different options and add in your experiences, submit that, and then follow up with the supplemental application. What about the GRE or MCAT? Did some of those uh, schools require that for PA in the States? For the States, um, MCAT CAT was not required, at least for the ones I applied to. Some of them did say you can add it in um, if you did take it, but GRE was required for most of the universities, which definitely limited my options. Um, so I think I applied to seven universities, but looking at other students who applied to PA school, um, or even uh, med school, I had a couple of friends who applied to med schools, and um, in the States you have more options, so you would apply to like 20 universities. Um, so, yeah, like GRE is like a common requirement for universities in the States. And because you're Canadian applying to an American case, well, was there anything special that you had to do differently for that process? Yep, yeah, so um, the transcript uh, conversion, so West evaluation was something that was a common uh, thing for anyone applying from Canada to the States. Um, I think uh, in terms of course requirements too, some of the courses were different um, when compared to Ontario universities and uh, American universities, some of the courses were different so you had to sometimes call in and say, is this equivalent to your organic chemistry or something like that. Um, I can't think of anything else off the top of my mind, but other than like the personal statement being a supplemental application, um, a longer version, or um, and I think the personal statement for the American applications were more um, a broad, open question. It was like, why do you want to be a PA? 
And it's different in the way you write that because for the Canadian universities, when you write those paragraphs, you want to be succinct and you want to get to the point. But for those personal statements, you want to be creative. You want to be capturing the reader's attention. So I personally started off with a story. So I started off with um, me playing on the tennis court and um, getting a shoulder injury and how that uh, kind of sparked an interest in sciences and the human body and then my journey from there to undergrad. So it was more like a chronological story, but everyone takes a different uh, approach to personal statements. But the supplemental applications in Canada would be more a focused question and how you would do research and apply kind of your personal um, aspects in a shorter paragraph.